Merry Christmas, and welcome to our Christmas Eve service from 7 p.m. on December 24th, 2018. Tonight, Paul is sharing a message called, God's Got This, and Paul's looking at Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. Here is Paul's Christmas Eve message, You've Got This. So as uh, if you were here yesterday, um, and some of you know this story, I grew up uh, next door to my grandparents. They had a swinging gate installed between my parents' house and my grandparents' house so we could go back and forth and hang out and see each other. And as I was doing sermon prep um, back in November for Advent season and and Christmas Eve, um, I was reminded of my grandfather. And, And somehow, my grandfather went to church most Sundays, but he had two hall passes every year. One was the Indianapolis 500. So some of you are old enough in this room to remember when the, well, some of you might even know what the Indianapolis 500 is, so you can ask someone next to you what it is if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's a big speed race in Indianapolis, Indiana. And anyway, my grandfather was a mechanic. He loved car racing. So on Memorial Day weekend, he had a hall pass on Sunday morning to stay at home and listen to the Indianapolis 500, because if you recall, until about the mid-80s, they did not broadcast it on television, and he got to stay at home and just simply listen to it on the radio. So that was hall pass number one. Hall pass number two was Christmas Eve. Now, I won't ask how many of you in this room wish that you had a hall pass on Christmas (laughs) Eve. I'm not going to ask that question. But somehow, he had a hall pass on Christmas Eve, and I'm not sure that it was my grandmother's neuroses that created it, or if it was my grandfather just wanting to stay at home and take a nap on Christmas Eve night, or what it was, but he said that he was in charge of security on Christmas Eve. (laughs) Because security, you know, because our houses were connected, and therefore, he basically said, if anything were to, quote unquote, happen on Christmas Eve, he would be able to take care of that. So if a Christmas tree spontaneously combusts in my house, we knew Grandpa John was there to rush over and do whatever it is that he might do to keep... If someone left the stove on, right, and we went to Christmas Eve service and something happened, my grandfather was there. What freaked me out, though, is he talked about what if someone came and stole Christmas while you were at the Christmas Eve service, I didn't mention that at the 5 p.m. service, and we have a lot of young children here, but it always kind of freaked me out, like the bad guys would come and steal Christmas, and I'd come back from the Christmas Eve church service at church, you know, where we've been singing Joy to the World and all that sort of stuff, and Christmas would be gone. So anyway, he was Mr. Security. He was there to keep the bad stuff from happening. I got two emails this past Friday morning regarding security, but regarding security in a way that my grandfather would have never understood. It is possible, these emails began, that your personal information may have been accessed due to a security breach. Now, one of those was from a fairly well-known corporation that if I were to say it out loud, you would know exactly who it is. They make these. (laughs) The second one was from an unnamed school district of which my children have both attended and are still attending. Just to let you know that your child or your student's social security number may have been accessed from the outside, please remain vigilant. My child is not even 18 years old. How am I supposed to remain vigilant when it comes to that? My grandfather would have never understood security breaches when it comes to the internet. Heck, some of us in this room may not understand. Whatever it is, you're like, Paul, you're batting zero. I don't understand the Indianapolis 500. I don't understand security breaches. I'm just ready to go home, okay? So... No hall passes, okay? You all are here. I hate to break that to you, but you're here already. But there is this sense that what my grandfather wanted to do and what we want to do is we want to push back the darkness. We want to remain safe. We want to have it all together. 
We want to do whatever we can do to stay secure, to stay safe. But as we know in this world that we are a part of, the darkness often seems just to creep in more and more and more. And so what we are celebrating this evening is we're celebrating the God who says, I've got this. The darkness does not win. The light shines in the darkness, as we're going to hear in just a little bit. But God says to each and every one of us here this evening, I've got this. I'm with you. And so this evening what we want to do is we want to take a look. Actually, this time from the Gospel of Matthew. We, we really don't consider Matthew a lot when we gather on Christmas Eve services. I actually looked, I was like, when was the last time I preached from Matthew chapter 1 on Christmas Eve? And it's been like five or six years, so I was like, well, it's a good time to go back and take a look at this text. I like this text because it gives us a little insight into Joseph, not as much on Mary as we get in the Gospel of Luke, but it gives us insight into both of them. And so this is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. And so he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, took Mary home as his wife. They did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, And he gave him the name Jesus. So we know this story. Mary is out in the middle of nowhere, doing her thing, engaged. An angel of the Lord Gabriel shows up and says that you are highly favored, Mary, and you will be with child. And Mary responds to that and accepts this great and incredible calling that God has placed on her life. And I think about the maturity that she must have had to trust God like that. To know the ramifications, to know the implications of what might result by saying yes. That great song was written 20 or 25 years ago, you know, Mary, did you know? And it asks the question, did you know what was going to happen with your son? Did you fully understand that? Did you know that he would help the lame to walk and the blind to see, the mute to speak? Did you know that he would be the great I am? And we don't know exactly how much of that that Mary totally understood, but she understood enough to know that God was with her to say, may it be done. God, may you come into my life and may I give birth to the one who will be king of kings and lord of lords. And how about Joseph? The scriptures tell us that Joseph had in mind to simply walk away. In that day and age, you were engaged for a year and if you know the story, what would happen is once a man went to a woman and asked her to marry him, He would return to his father's house. John chapter 14, in my father's house are many rooms. So Joseph, what is he? Well, he's a carpenter. And so what does he do? Well, he goes back home to his father's house. And what does he begin to do after he's engaged to Mary? He begins to build on a room for her so that they can come together and they can be married and they can live with his parents because that's the way things worked. And so Joseph is building this this little room on on his father's house. And guess what happens? Any of you ever lived in a small town? I guess not. You all are pretty quiet about that. I've lived in some small towns. 
Do you know how quickly gossip spreads in a small town? Well, even a large town probably, but particularly in a small town. Did you hear? Have you heard, right? It's always in hushed tones. I'm praying for you. You know, that kind of sort of thing. <laughs> I got something you need to pray about. None of you have probably ever done anything like this. I'm, I'm quite sure. But it's a small town. And word gets out. And Joseph says, I'll quietly divorce her. I don't want to bring shame upon her. And he probably doesn't want to bring shame on himself. He says, this is how I will handle it. I've got this. And the angel of the Lord says, no, that's not the plan. The plan is that you'll stay with her. The plan is that you'll marry her. The plan is she'll give birth and you're to name this child Jesus. How would you have responded to that? I mean, that's crazy. But because Joseph knows that God says, I've got this, Joseph knows that he's got it. But here's the dilemma. And here's the dilemma for me. And here's the dilemma perhaps for many of us in this room. Is that we live in a society and we live in a world and we we live in a culture where we love to say, I've got this. Now, I could blame this all on my childhood because I'm a firstborn child. So firstborn children have always got this. At least that's what my younger brother tells me. I could blame on the fact that I am perhaps a little type A. My family's not here, so none of them can respond to that. They all agreed readily at 5 o'clock, by the way. I could say it's perhaps because I have a few control issues that I like to say, I've got this. I'm sure I'm not speaking to anybody else in the room except for me, so thank you for allowing me to do a little therapy on myself on Christmas Eve. (laughs) But we love to say, I've got this. My daughter and I were driving to Spokane to drop her off at school in September, and it's about a 22-hour drive, I think. It's a long, 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 long drive. And my daughter kept saying to me, because I was driving, and she said, would you like for me to drive? And I'm like, no, I've got this. Because here's the deal. I don't like to drive. But you know what I hate more than driving? Somebody else driving me. Because I like to be in control and to say, I've got this. Whatever it is that needs to happen, I've got this. We go on vacations, I've got this. We go as a family to New York. I'll plan it. I've got this. We go to whatever other place it is. Same exact story. My wife and I were talking, and and she said, do you remember this trip that we took to Europe? I'm going to show you some pictures, and you can see if you can uh, just guess where it was that we went on this trip. So this is, in case you're not kind of, it's, it's going to slowly get there. This is a city, what used to be a city in Italy. And it kind of was decimated by a mountain that you just saw a little bit ago. And, and so we go to Pompeii. And I say, I've got this. And my, you know, my kids by this time have learned, they're like, can't we just get a tour guide? Or can't we get those headphones? And I'm like, No. I've got this. So what I did is I got my cell phone. I downloaded Rick Steves for Italy. (laughs) Put it on my Kindle, right, app. Pulled that baby up as we walked into Pompeii. And I said, it's a two or a three hour tour and we can see everything that you want to see in Pompeii. I even highlighted things. If you go and look at my Kindle, things are highlighted because I've got this. So we start walking. Now, I should have mentioned it was about 95 degrees when we got there and humid. And my kids start literally like melting and wilting because they've lived in San Diego their entire lives. And they don't know what heat and humidity are all about. And one of them, whom I shall not mention, was, had just had it. And I'm like, look, much more nicely than I am doing right now. 
Your mom grew up in Bakersfield, California. Your dad grew up in Fresno, California. You can handle heat. I don't want to hear about this because I've got it. And they're like, Dad, we're thirsty. I was like, I'm not spending $4 on a bottle of water so you can have something to drink that's only going to... Now, I know I I paint myself as a terrible father. I'm really not that bad, all right? (laughs) But I'm like, no, we don't need to do that. And I tell you, and you can ask them this, they say, this is the way we saw you in the whole time in Pompeii, like this, walking like this and explaining everything. I've got it! And I so didn't have it. We think we've got it, but we don't. Mary, we're told, treasured everything in her heart because she knew that God was with her. She knew that God had it. Christmas comes in to the mess. Christmas comes in with this great announcement that we don't have to have it. Because God's got it. God enters into the mess. God enters into the uncertainty. God sends his son into the darkness to bring light. It is where God meets us. Because what's going to happen is if we keep saying, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, we're going to end up in that darkness. And yet God still says, I'm going to meet you. Frederick Buechner puts it like this. I love Frederick Buechner. And he has this quote. He says, anyone who has ever known Jesus has known him perhaps better in the dark than anywhere else because it is in the dark where he seems to visit us most often. It is in the dark where Jesus seems to visit us most often to bring his hope and to bring his light, to bring that salvation that we celebrate here this evening. So here's my hope for us, is that we'll quit saying, I've got this. I keep praying, Lord, help me to start saying that, to rely more and more upon you and less and less upon myself. Because ultimately what Mary and Joseph teach us is that God's got this. Mary knew that God was with her. She said, Lord, I'll do whatever it takes to bring this life into the world. So my friends, my prayer and my hope is that this Christmas Eve and tomorrow on Christmas Day, that instead of saying, I've got this, we would say, God, thank you for having this because God's got us. And because of that, we can do all things through him and through his son, Jesus Christ. Pray with me, please. God, thank you that your word never fails. Thank you that you stand with us. Thank you that Jesus came to save us. He did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. And God, as we sing and as we listen and as we're reminded this evening of your great love, may we do so with a joy. God, may we give our lives to you and recognize that you've got this. And because you've got this, we've got this. Thank you for loving us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for listening. On Sunday, December 30th, we'll have one service at 10 a.m. in the sanctuary. Then you're invited to join us as we serve a warm meal to 250 individuals and families who are suffering from homelessness at First Presbyterian Church downtown. We're also hosting 12 to 15 homeless guests from January 12th through the 26th through Interfaith Shelter. We need help with overnight hosting, setup, and breakdown at the end. 
find lots more information at ljpress.org slash interfaith. You can find a complete listing of what's going on around La Jolla Press on our website at ljpress.org. That's ljpres.org. Or call the church office at 858-454-0713. We hope you have a wonderful week full of many blessings. Happy New Year, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.